Hello, my name is John Brisson, author of Fix Your Gut, health coach. Welcome to the Fix Your Gut YouTube channel. And today we're going to talk about and continue our series on um, hemostatic sore organisms um, with the uh, probiotic, the Garden of Life probiotic, Primal Defense, which contains the strain Bacillus subtilis. Um, now, I made my issues known a little bit uh, previously with most hemostatic sore organism or spore forming uh, probiotic supplements. Um, but you know, there is a wide range between the issues that could be caused by these supplements. Now you have some bacteria within this genus, um, you know, specific species, um, where they tend to be more, um, probiotic than others and some that can, can, can cause more likely to cause infections and some that can cause serious life threatening illnesses. Um, so, you know, those, we, we divide those bacteria pretty much between the ones that seem to be more probiotic, uh, starting with a bacillus coagulans, which I'll eventually do a, uh, a, a, a video on that, or um, the next one being bacillus subtilis, uh, which is, um, you know, a lot of people consider probiotic, but I still have my reservations for it. And then you have the, the ones that are still put in supplements, but still can cause a lot of issues, uh, like, like bacillus lichenformis, for example, which has been known to cause a lot of, uh, of infection within medical literature. And then you have um, the, the organization, the, or, the, or, is it, the organism uh, bacillus uh, thernogenesis, uh, which is, uh, uh, produces the, the Bt toxin, which is, the, the genes from the bacteria are inserted into corn to produce that toxin to genetically modified corn. Um, and that uh, bacteria, which I do not think has any probiotic use whatsoever, is found in the new formulation of prescriptocyst, which I'll get to that in the next video when we talk about prescriptocyst. And then um, you have uh, Bacillus uh, cereus. Uh, which is one of the main causes of food poisoning. You usually get it from um, eating improperly prepared uh, rice or improperly reheated rice. And then you have, of course, the granddaddy of all uh, of the Bacillus genus that causes the most issues, which is Bacillus anthracticus, which of course causes the disease known as anthrax. Um, so yeah, they range from being, you know, possibly beneficial like Bacillus coagulus, but I need to see more studies on that. We'll get to talk about more in the video. To today's bacteria Bacillus subtilis, then you get to the other ones which definitely cause issues. So Bacillus subtilis, like many of the hemostatic soil organisms we talk about that are bacteria, it forms endospores. Um, and you know, the, the, the endospores, they're very tough. They're very hardy. Um, you know, and, and I mean, the, heck, the, when the bacteria was studied in the space in the 1960s and 1970s, the endospores were theorized that if they were coated in space dust, they could survive six years and then return to Earth and, and, and germinate when giving um, the right um, nutrients that a lot of these bacteria like, like L-alanine, L-valine, and L-asparagine, and fructose that they need to germinate. And even though it's exposed, you know, it has, without oxygen in the spore, when exposed to extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun, you know, unprotected mostly, for the most part, except for a little bit of space dust, it would still survive. These bacteria are hardy when they're in endospore form. They survive, um, they're mostly antibiotic resistant, and except for a lot of strong antibiotics, like uh, Bacillus subtilis appears to be weak to, um, um, Tetracycline, which is a very broad spectrum antibiotic, which is can affect a lot of both gram positive and gram negative, which can really uh, re harm people's gut floras when, when taken incorrectly. Or the drugs are supposedly antibiotics of last resort that hospitals give out like candy right now because they have so many infections that require these strong antibiotics. But those antibiotics like vancomycin and gentamicin. Um, the, uh, the Bacillus subtilis endospores actually may be weak to, but it takes very strong antibiotics to be able to have an effect on these bacteria when they're on their endospore form. So these bacteria can, you know, they can survive. They're antibiotic resistant when they're in endospore form. They're, 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 they're heat resistant. They can survive uh, boiling. Um, they can survive um, ultraviolet radiation. They can survive a lack of nutrients or a lack of uh, substance, uh, substance for, for, for years 
um, until they are able to get what they need, like fructose, for example, to germinate. Um, they, they require oxygen mainly for germin germination, even though some uh, species of Bacillus subtilis are anaerobic. Um, but, you know, they can, they, the endospore form, they can live without oxygen. Um, you know, they're, they're resistant to chemical disinfection, too. I mean, it takes exposure to, to bleach for a long period of time uh, in a strong concentration to be able to penetrate to kill the bacteria when they're in endospore form. So these endospores are hardy. Now, everybody that, you know, that talks about whether it's Chris Kresser or Dr. Josh Axe, they say that's a good thing because the endospores allow the bacteria to survive the stomach acid. And if you take them enough, frequently enough, they will eventually germinate in the large intestine or even the small intestine if you don't produce enough bile. If you have bile producing issues because but uh, the bacteria from the bacillus genus, they cannot germinate in bile. However, bacteria in the clostridium um, uh, genus can, like Clostridium difficile, even though they're endospore bacteria, they can germinate in bile. Um, but bacillus cannot, um, from, from, from the research that I've looked at. So, you know, if, you have, if, you, if you're producing, you have bile issues, you have probatella overgrowth, you know, you decide to take one of these supplements, the bacillus subtilis, after repeat taking of a couple of, anywhere between a couple of days, a couple weeks, a couple of months, um, could actually start becoming normal flora within your gut. Um, so yeah, they, they, they do survive stomach acid and they can uh, propagate after a repeat exposure or if you give them enough nutrients. If your diet has those amino acids, like if you're eating protein, for example, or you're taking any BCAAs or you're eating any fructose, they will germinate when the conditions are right. Um, it just takes repeat exposure. You know, a lot of people write in to me, well, I just took a few capsules of, of the spore uh, probiotic. Um, let's, we'll just take, um, we'll say primal defense, for example. Um, and I didn't feel good. Oh my God, are they, have they colonized in my intestinal tract? More than likely they haven't. Uh, you, your immune system just had a reaction to, a negative reaction to the bacillus subtilis, and in doing so, you felt bad, which, is, which, which can happen uh, with any probiotic. Um, so, you know, they say it's a good thing that the endospore can survive the stomach acid because, you know, there's some bacteria that are diff have a difficult time surviving stomach acid. We consider probiotic bacteria like Bifidobacterium, for example. Now, lactobacillus, on the other hand, can survive the stomach acid. Most, most strains of lactobacillus can survive a very low pH. Um, so they say that's a good thing. And I, and I agree with them on that. It is, it is, if you want a probiotic, you want it to be able to survive the low pH of the stomach. I agree. Problem is, is the endospores make them hard to eliminate and the bacteria can switch back and forth, especially when it's under pressure to protect itself. Um, so they can make it very difficult to eliminate. You know, you can try, you have to coax it out of the endospore and there are ways of doing that, like using the, um, the, en the enzyme lysozyme, which will break down the lipid uh, layer of the, of the spore so that the spore will, will break apart and, and you can kill the bacteria inside. Um, um, easier. So there are some supplements you can take to reduce the endospores, but a lot of people don't know about that. So if you have an opportunistic infection, which I'll tell a personal story, Jason Hooper from Fix Your Gut, he um, had to have his sudden abdominal surgery, and he tells this story in our HSO live stream, where he was taking Dr. Friedlander's uh, probiotic, which had Bacillus subtilis in there, which they don't even sell anymore, by the way. And he got an opportunistic Bacillus subtilis overgrowth his intestinal tract because his immune system was weakened from the antibiotics that he had taken uh, because of the surgery. And, uh, he, you know, that's when he actually when we first met. He came to me on the Bulletproof forums asking for advice of what he could do because the doctors were scratching the head. They, 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 they did a PCR test of his stool um, and they were able to determine that um, Bacillus subtilis, even though he had stopped taking it for a few days, um, had colonized and it was more likely the issue. Um, they were also able to, cult, uh, cult, uh, were able to, to, to get a blood culture too as well because he had developing septicemia uh, from it. So, um, you know, I put him on a protocol. He decided to go uh, very heavily into it and take Interface as well as thymol. Uh, thymol oil, which I do not recommend for most people. It's a, the most potent natural antimicrobial agent that we have. And Jason was able to get it in remission. It was able to recover, and that's why we have him around today. So my idea of most spore-forming supplements are here are the risks, except for the new formulation of Proserpticis. I do not believe the supplementation of Bacillus thuringiensis, thuringiensis as a probiotic is completely, because of the risk of the BT toxin, which I wrote about that in my blog, and I'll talk about that more in depth in a in video on Proserpticis. 
It's too much of a risk. But the rest of the supplements, I'm just saying, look, no one ever talks about the negatives. There are negatives. I even talk about the negatives of lactobacillus and get no flack about that. I talk about the negatives of possible bifidobacterium, which they seem to be very few negatives, but they're there. Every probiotic has negatives and can cause bad issues in some people. But for some reason, since I don't recommend spore formers, I talk about the negative risks. I'm a boogeyman. Where if I talked about the negative risks of lactobacillus, well, I, no one has a problem with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, some people do say if you Google the infection reports of lactobacillus, there, there, there are many, they're numerous. But when you Google the infection reports of bacillus, there's not as much. There's more for liconformis than there are for subtilis. But there are papers, research papers, where authors came to the same conclusion that I did. The reason being is because they didn't test them. They would have never tested Jason if he would have said, hey, I was taking this probiotic. I need you to test me for bacillus subtilis and it became this problem. They test lactobacillus because most people say, hey, I've taken a probiotic. The doctor tests for lactobacillus. A lot of stool tests test, test for lactobacillus, basically. So, of course, they're going to find if someone has a dysbiosis of lactobacillus or is the cause of their, their septicemia or infection. It's, it's more likely found. If they test bacillus, they probably show up more. Um, but, you know, people do say I'm too cautious. Look, all I'm saying is that you have to be careful, okay? We do know that there may be some benefits of taking bacillus coagulus, and there may be some benefits for taking bacillus subtilis. And if you are going to take, if you die hard, we're going to take an HSO probiotic. Those would be the strains that you would specifically take, and only those strains are the ones that I can recommend at this time. I just don't think there's enough research behind it. There was a study where the 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 the, the, the gut associated lymphatic tissue you know you're the mucosal barrier you know the tissue where it gives us our immune system within our gut the lymphoid tissue that's down there bacillus exposure early in life and they did this study in rats made a very healthy gut a very healthy immune system within the gut but this study also talked about that the keystone species meaning that it is found in a majority of guts of human beings it is a primary species of bacteria bacteroids fragilis which has its own issues too. It's a gram-negative bacteria that can produce endotoxins. You know, I've coached many people with dysbiosis of bacteroids. It does the same thing. And it does the same thing with less risk because bacillus, even bacillus subtilis, is not normally found in the human microbiome or something that forms colony. Most of the time it's passive. Any roller exposure, you just pass the endospores through them. They may germinate for a short period of time, but most of the time you pass them out so they can spread and they can move around, okay? Human beings are not the primary host for most of the bacillus genus, if not all of it. Um, I mean, even the study, they talk about how bacillus anthracticus, the worst possible ex exploitation, you know, worst possible ex um, experience, it uses the gout for its infection. It uses it specifically, not in a good way, but in a bad way. So, you know, they even come to the conclusion that bacteria fragilis is probably the safest bet, and you got that more than likely from your mother's, either your mother's uterine microbiome or exposure through, you know, being vaginally birthed, or it grows from exposure of the first few days of life through, you know, getting breast milk. So it's a lot safer than being exposed to bacillus, even bacillus subtilis. They even talk about that. So, you know, and look, I do know that the Japanese, they eat natto. Natto is fermented with bacillus subtilis. They do ingest some bacillus subtilis, and there are some benefits of natto, as long as it's made from non-genetically modified soybeans, organic soybeans. And it does have a good amount of vitamin K2 in it, which is very good for vegans who don't get a lot of vitamin K2. Nonetheless, they don't eat natto. Most Japanese people don't eat natto on a daily basis. So any of the bacillus subtilis that they ingest, most of it's going to pass through as endospores. They don't colonize their gut, and it's not found in many human beings. So it's not native flora, and that's my biggest issue. It's not native flora 
hasn't been studied very well in human beings as native flora. It has been studied extensively in a commercial aspect for genetic modification. It's one of the most studied bacteria in the world in that regard. Um, and being able to produce uh, certain things that are needed for the, the biochemical industry, okay? A lot of genetically engineered or genetically modified bacteria do that. It's very similar to E. coli. E. coli is one of the most studied bacteria in the world for that purpose too, but it's not studied as much as humans, and that's why I cannot recommend it. I will say this. Again, if you have to take a spore-forming supplement because you feel like it is best for your health, human Bacillus subtilis, HU58, human source Bacillus subtilis, and possibly Bacillus coagulans is your safest bet. That being said, I do not recommend primal defense because of my issues with spore forming and, and, and endospore forming bacteria, and I do not recommend the strain Bacillus subtilis overall. Um, I hope you found this video informative. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I hope you have a good day.